changed our cleaning procedures and how that affected what we did in the rest of our business um, together for you so that you could see how, how it worked. Well, um, to ask a question, uh, just go ahead and use the chat tool, and um, you can ask that a question anytime during the webinar using that chat tool. And um, we we do take live questions at the end, and uh, you can always call us at Modern Cleaning. Email works too. Yes. And um, you're always welcome to use this as a technical resource. But um, today we're going to be talking about what is productivity. We're going to define it, and why it's important, especially in this industry, how to improve productivity. Um, we will show you some of our standard processes and our tools that, and why we chose them, um, how we measure the work that we do and our um, cleaning technicians do. An example of a customer worksheet that will show you how we define our specification of work. We'll discuss how we train and we'll discuss teamwork and how everyone participates in all of these steps. And uh, this story we tell every time we have one of these <laughs> as we talk about how uh, modern cleaning just kind of grew out of what we started doing in the field um, testing this equipment and research, putting the research behind it, and also um, how we try to keep up to date with um, the latest trends and the latest equipment so that we can continue to keep our um, tools and processes up to date. And our philosophy here um, is to protect the health of our clients, to protect the health of our cleaning technicians, and um, to try to keep our carbon footprint very low, and to improve the environment in which we clean. While making it look good. Yeah. <laughs> that goes without saying. Um, one of the most frequently asked questions we get is how on earth do you clean homes, lugging around the backpack vacuum and the ladybug um, without, um, in the same time that we do when we carry around our caddy of cleaning chemicals? Yeah, the whole idea of uh, chemical free cleaning is uh, kind of hard to get your arms around if uh, you don't study the actual uh, elements of. Uh, how you perform it, and uh, intuitively one uh, think, would think it would uh, take longer. Um, if we do a good job uh, in this presentation, hopefully at the end, uh, the answer to this question will, will, will be fairly obvious, and hopefully we'll uh, share some information that will be, be valuable. Um, let's begin our discussion, uh, the, the fun part of this, by talking a little bit about productivity. What is productivity? A lot of different definitions, a lot of different ways of looking at it, but for our purposes, let's uh, talk about productivity in terms of output divided by input. Um, specifically for, for this discussion, we're going to uh, be speaking of productivity in terms of revenue per hour, specifically labor hour, hours that you're paying people to clean. So productivity is defined as revenue per hour. Our objective is to make that productivity number as high as it can be. We want the higher the better. So, you know, if you're currently getting $30 per labor hour, your objective should be try to get to 31, 32, 33, 35, and there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, one obvious way is just to charge more for the service you're providing, and that's always good to do if you can do that and convince your your your, your clients to, to to pay a higher price. But at some point, uh, they're not going to want to pay any more than they're currently paying, so you're left with the only other alternative, which is to clean that home 
faster while still satisfying their expectations in order to increase your productivity. And that's the part that we're really going to focus on is how can we reduce the amount of time that it takes to clean a home. Um, let's talk about an example here. Uh, pretend a uh, customer is paying you $120 to clean a home. Uh, pretend you work with uh, two people on a team, and two people go in and it takes them two hours, uh, two technicians, uh, two hours to clean a home. So two technicians times two uh, clock hours, that's four labor hours. So 120 divided by four labor hours is $30 per labor hour. That's an example of productivity. And we're going to be talking about a number of examples uh, through the rest of this discussion that are going to uh, be based on this same general uh, premise of how we measure and calculate productivity. And again, our objective would be to reduce the labor hours so when you're dividing 120 by something less than four, then this number gets bigger. And when we're doing that, we're making more money. So with that, uh, being our definition of productivity, it begs the question, well, why is it important? Um, I want to introduce a concept called Pareto's Principle. It's often referred to as the 80-20 rule. And uh, it applies to a lot of uh, processes or just, you know, aspects of life. Um, some examples of, of how you can use it would be, uh, say, 80% of your fill-in-the-blank represents 20% of your fill-in-the-blank. For example, 80% of your revenue represents 20% of your customers. 80% um, of your expenses uh, represents 20% of your expense categories. 80% of your headaches come from 20% of your employees. You can go on and on and on with that. Um, what does that mean to us uh, when we're talking about, about productivity and why it's important? Uh, what we're going to find here very shortly is uh, most of your expenses come from uh, a, a very narrow uh, part of your uh, expense uh, categories on your, your, your P&L. Um, this is an example of, of what I mean by that. If you look at all your expenses in terms of a pie chart, uh, the majority of it, if you're running your business uh, the way that uh, you're supposed to be running it, if you have insurance and paying taxes and, and paying your people uh, you know, legal wage, the majority of your expense is going to be tied up in labor. Uh, you might look at uh, you know, probably over half of it, would be what you would call direct labor. That's the amount of money that you're paying the people that are cleaning homes for you, your actual technicians pay. Um, a smaller amount, but yes, yet significant amount, would be what you would call indirect labor, which would be the pay going to uh, your office staff, person answering your phones, maybe somebody doing sales. They aren't directly cleaning, but they're on your payroll nevertheless. Um, and all your other expenses would uh, could be lumped uh, into a small piece of pie. In this case, we call it other. Um, so it's not, you know, 80% of your expenses are tied up in your payroll. In this example, it would be 75%. But, and this is just illustrative, this will be different for every company. But the fact of the matter is, if we want to reduce expenses in our company, the most obvious place to look would be, our payroll and, and direct labor payroll, and that's directly related to productivity. So that's why productivity is important. Oftentimes, we spend a whole lot of time focusing on this piece of pie here that says other. The trouble is, that's not one homogeneous thing. That other is broken down into numerous different expense categories, each one of them being relatively small. You got a little bit for advertising, a little bit for your space costs, a little bit for what you pay for supplies, you got transportation, insurance, yada, yada, yada. But if you focus on any one of those, and even if you, you know, reduce that expense by 5, 10, 15, 20 percent, at the end of the day, it's not going to be a really big amount of money relative to what type of savings you could get if you attack this really large piece of pie over here. 
So that's why productivity is so important because when you start improving productivity, you start lowering your costs over here. So if you're going to start lowering your costs, you want to lower your cost where most of your cost is. That kind of goes in line with uh, what we'll call the Willie Sutton rule. Uh, Willie Sutton was a bank robber back in the 1940s. And rumor has it that uh, once he was finally uh, arrested and put in jail, um, a reporter asked him, why, do you rob, why did you rob banks? And his answer was, because that's where the money is. Uh, sometime later in life, he said he never really said that. Uh, that was just a reporter trying to make a good story. But nevertheless, by that time, he was uh, known for, for making that quote. And, I mean, the Willie Sutton rule is, is taught in business school. So if you look and reduce your cost, you want to start with where most of your cost is. Why do I rob banks? That's where the money is. Where am I going to reduce my cost? I'm going to reduce my cost first where the money is, and that's in my payroll, my direct labor payroll. That's why I want to improve my productivity. So how do I improve productivity? What affects my productivity? Uh, cleaning procedure is a big part of it. Uh, how we ask our people to clean, how we train them, uh, what level of consistency we get, are we doing the same thing time after time again, are we uh, measuring performance, are we providing feedback on that performance, are we looking for opportunities to improve, is it, is it a priority day in and day out to make sure that we're being as productive as we possibly can be? If, if the answer to any of these questions isn't the right answer, then we're missing an opportunity to control our expense and make a lot more money in our business. This productivity thing is really, really important. Um, another part of it is uh, what we'll call the booking system. Uh, said another way, this is specification of work. Um, in order to be as productive as, as you can hope to be, you need to make sure that Everybody involved in the process has the same understanding of what the objectives are and what the end product is supposed to look like. That's particularly important between uh, the cleaning contractor, which is us, and our, our customers. Um, we don't want to be doing things that they don't expect us to do. Likewise, we don't want them to be expecting us to do things that we don't do. So it's really important to have uh, common shared expectations that match up. And once we do that, those expectations need to be documented in a detailed way in a specification of work. Each home should have a detailed specification of work. Now, if we're doing this right, a lot of the details are going to be the same amongst all of the homes. We don't want to come in and have to do a completely different cleaning procedure for every home, but every home has some, some, some special needs, and that would be the part that we would uh, that would be detailed on a home-to-home on -home basis. But if we're doing a good job with a a uh, detailed cleaning procedure and if our training uh, process is right and if we're doing good measurement and good follow-up and good leadership, we're going to find that uh, all your cleaning technicians are going to be doing it the same way and delivering the same deliverable to, to your clients. All that adds up to higher productivity. That being said, you need to have a plan for correction. You need to prepare to be constantly training. You need to be measuring. You need to be observing. You need to be looking at your numbers. And if you aren't making uh, the level of uh, productivity, the revenue per hour that you expect to get, you need to uh, be prepared to take action to correct that. And there could be a number of different things you need to do. Maybe the rate's too low. Maybe your, your cleaning cleaners, your technicians aren't following procedure. It could be one of a number of things, but you've got to know it and you've got to take action to fix it. And that's an ongoing, continuous improvement process. Uh, so just recapping that thought, we need to make sure that we have uh, – good job specification, and we need to constantly be looking to improve our processes to meet that uh, specification with the fewest labor hours possible. Another important aspect of improving productivity would be to um, look for tools that, that allow us to be more efficient. A uh, tool could be anywhere from a vacuum cleaner to the cleaning towels we use, to the cleaning chemicals we use, to something as simple as a scraper or a brush, but some tools allow us to accomplish more work in less amount of time, and we always need to be looking for that. How do we know which tools are better? Well, one dimension of that is we have to have a process in place to, to measure which ones perform better. 
We have to do that constantly, not only for the purpose of evaluating tools, but more importantly to monitor the process to make sure that your cleaning technicians are doing what they're supposed to do in the time that they're supposed to do it. Feedback is an important part of that as well. You want to make sure that you're giving feedback to your technicians if they're making their number or if they aren't making their number. And later on, we're going to be talking a little bit more about that, where you want them to participate in that feedback process. Training is ongoing. Uh, you can't get productivity without training, constant training. And you need to encourage uh, participation by all your team members. When you really start talking about increased productivity, we like to say there's a big difference between uh, compliance and, and, and commitment. And in order to uh, really uh, get levels of high productivity, you just can't mandate that. You have to have people who want to uh, perform at a higher level. And we're going to talk a little bit about a few techniques to make that happen once we get a little deeper into the program. So we talk about productivity. It's about getting uh, more work done in less amount of time. So what is work and how is it defined? Um, this is, um, I guess, some some a basic understanding of industrial engineering, if you will. If you want to roll the clock back a hundred years, there were uh, a couple of, uh, I guess, efficiency experts is what they called themselves at the time. Frank and Lily and Gilbreth. Uh, they wrote the book Cheaper by the Dozen. I think that'll be a resource we'll be sharing at the end of the presentation. But they uh, broke work out into 16 basic elements. Is it 16 or 18? I'm sorry. It's 18 basic elements. And basically, any type of work, and I guess you can define work as uh, force times distance. Anytime that you're performing work, there's motion involved, and motion can be defined in and com combining these 18 different elements. And the idea is to understand uh, when you're doing a job, if you're cleaning uh, a bathroom or vacuuming carpet or whatever, actually look at the process, figure out what, which of these elements are comprising that, that, that process, that method, and look for ways to eliminate work elements if they aren't really adding value. And the ones on the right-hand side in particular are ones that uh, if you have processes that reduce these or eliminate these, you're going to be uh, performing work uh, more efficiently, more quickly, and have a higher level of productivity. And even if it's effective, you want to want to reduce these as well. Um, let's see if we can illustrate how this would work. We talked about tools and how having the right tools can help you be more productive. What we have here is a picture of a cleaning technician wearing a cleaning apron. And there are a number of tools that are uh, in this cleaning apron. We can see uh, microfiber cleaning cloths. This is a terry cloth. This is a polishing cloth. Here are more clean ones up here that haven't yet been used. Here is a uh, grout brush. Here are a couple of scrub pads. Here's a dry sponge, a scraper. Here are a couple of spray bottles that are hanging off of the end. So how would this tool uh, help us be more effective. What are we seeing here? Well, there's several things going on. First off, every tool is in a specific place. And if we make it a habit of putting these tools in these specific locations, when a technician needs, uh, say, their, their grout brush, for instance, they won't be searching for it. They won't even have to think about it. They'll automatically reach for it. So we've basically eliminated the need to search for that tool. Likewise, if I'm carrying my uh, spray bottles with me, I uh, will not have to worry about walking across the room, which would be defined as transport empty, with my hands empty, basically going across the room to get that spray bottle I left, picking it up, which would be grasping. First, I have to search before I even walk and figure out where it is, walk over to it, pick it up, and then I have to walk back to where I was, probably think for a minute as to, you know, what I was doing before I had to go find my spray bottle and then get back to actually using it. If I've got it with me, I just, just automatically reach down and start cleaning. Eliminating all these various work elements makes me more productive. I'm getting more work done in less amount of time. Uh, a cleaning apron is a very excellent and low-cost tool that can pay for itself in a, a a remarkable amount of time. Um, notice here that these spray bottles, uh, they're not labeled, and if you're using these in the field, they should be clearly labeled in a, in a proper way to meet OSHA requirements and let you know what's in them. 
This is for illustrative purposes, but if you notice they have different color spray heads on them. That's another way that you can uh, eliminate the selection process because if you have a convention where your cleaning technicians know that the green spray head has one product and the orange one has another product, they will automatically grab it without thinking about, you know, what's in it. And your convention should be always have the green one on, in this case, I guess, the right side and the orange one on the left side. Again, the more detailed the specification and more um, disciplined we are in following the same convention time after time, the more efficient we will be and the more work will get done in the less amount of time. So that's what uh, these various uh, work elements uh, and how you would use them when evaluating a work process. Um, another example of, of how you can put tools together to increase productivity. We did a uh, presentation a couple of months ago when we evaluated various combinations of water cleaning solutions, engineered water and wiper combinations. And in that case, we were pretty much homogeneous in terms of what we were cleaning. We were cleaning desktops in a local grade school. At a home, it's a little more complicated. You've got different surfaces you're cleaning. You've got different types of soil on these surfaces. You've got different levels of soil. Some homes are a lot dirty than others. Um, as a rule, though, most of the work that we find ourselves doing is the ongoing maintenance cleans of, of, of customers that we clean week after week after week or you know, every, other, every other week uh, on a perpetual level. So the level of soil really isn't that great, but an opportunity for us to, to save time from a method standpoint is to use methods that eliminate or reduce the chance of resoiling. If we use certain cleaning products that leave a residue, they will collect soil and they will get dirtier, so it's going to take us more time to clean it the next time we come back. Likewise, you know, another example would be if we're, we're cleaning bathrooms and if we're using products that are just making the uh, mildew uh, basically fade away, bleach it out where you can't see it, well, it looks good for the moment, but it's going to grow back quickly. Or if we use other cleaning procedures such as dry steam vapor, it will actually kill the mildew and it will take longer for it to grow back. So when you're looking at productivity, especially for the homes that you clean on a regular basis, you want to look beyond just how long is it going to take you this one cleaning and think about how long is it going to take me over the long run to clean that home and have methods that are going to reduce your, your I guess, life cycle clean time of, of that location. I'm going to mention dwell time a little bit. Um, depending upon your, your, your cleaning method, you might be required to spray a product and let it set there and work a little bit before wiping it off. That's not necessarily a bad thing if you've got cleaning procedures that uh, direct your technicians to spray it and then go on and do something else if they do it in a logical way where things are going on in parallel. you got a chemical setting on a soiled surface dwelling while the technician is doing something else. Something that you definitely don't want to happen, and this is one of those uh, work elements that we talked about earlier, which is just wait time. You don't want any technician to spray something on a surface and just stand there and watch it for five minutes. Likewise, if you've got people working in teams, you don't want one person to get finished before the other person and just stand there and watch the other person work. Everybody needs to be as productive as they can be for the entire time that they're in the home. I'm going to mention wipe time a little bit. Oh, sorry, wipe time uh, also. Depending upon what wipers you use and what cleaning agents you use, that can have a profound impact on wipe time. We have a picture here of a technician cleaning a mirror using a... Uh, I guess that's a perfect clean microfiber polishing cloth. Uh, we implemented those, I guess, I said 10 years, and I was corrected earlier, 11 years yeah. ago? 11. <laughs> and when it comes to activities such as cleaning glass, it can significantly reduce the time because you can spray and give it one wipe and you don't have uh, any, any streaking or fog, you don't have any lint, whereas before we were using cotton towels, you would wipe, you know, half a dozen times, you'd stand back, look at it from an angle, you'd see streaks, you'd go back and wipe again, you could save a lot of time. And, uh, gee, this was, uh, like I said, this was over 10 years ago, and this is when we really started figuring out that we can make a, lar a bigger investment in the tools we're using and get that money back a number of times over on a uh, labor savings. Yeah, we actually started using our microfiber cloths before we started implementing the use of an apron. 
This is true. We um, the whole microfiber thing was it was a a milestone yeah. for sure. <laughs> But a, a 1999 study in a California hospital, which is kind of what brought our attention to the microfibers, was that um, their results showed that because microfibers were easier to use and faster to use for the cleaning staff at the hospital, um, they actually documented a 20% labor, labor savings per day. And, you know, we're talking about microfiber in a generic sense. We've talked previously, and there's a lot of information on the Modern Cleaning website, that not all microfiber is equal, and some microfiber performs a lot better in removing soil and helping you from a productivity standpoint than others. So just don't assume that uh, any microfiber will do. Um, you know, some of the lower-end products, it might... Uh, Look attractive when you're 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 checking out of your uh, local box store buying it, but you're not your chances of getting that level of productivity improvement that you would hope to get might not be there. So you really need to look and, and test to make sure you're, that you're getting a product that helps you the most with uh, reducing the labor time. Vacuums are another um, opportunity to reduce labor content and improve productivity. Uh, one resource that we're going to be sharing with you at the end of this presentation is a product that's produced by ISSA, which has work standards, which has allowed times for all different types of uh, cleaning tools. A lot of them are commercial products, such as, you know, floor machines, so on and so forth, but they do a, a really detailed treatment of all different types of vacuum cleaners. And if you refer to that resource, uh, the studies that they've done suggest that if I want to vacuum 1,000 square feet of carpet with a vacuum cleaner that has a 12-inch opening at the bottom, orifice as they, uh, the term that they use, uh, it would take me 26, almost 27 minutes if I was doing that with an upright vacuum. Likewise, I could do it in 24 minutes if I was doing it with a canister vacuum. Uh, but their studies suggest if they were doing it with a backpack vacuum, they could do it in a little over or a little less, actually, than eight and a half minutes. So if you do the arithmetic uh, between those, you know, you could save yourself, what, 16 to 20 minutes if uh, by using a backpack versus some of those other uh, vacuums for every 1,000 uh, square feet of carpet that you're vacuuming. And if you assume that your average home is going to be well over a thousand square feet, then theoretically you could save yourself 20 minutes, 20 labor minutes per home by switching to a backpack vacuum versus an upright. Now there are a lot of variables here. Um, you know how how is the home furnished? How much furniture is in it? How dense is it? How dirty is the carpet? How many people live there? So on and so forth. So you know none of this is exact. But I can tell you that in spirit and in reality, there is a real productivity savings, a measurable productivity savings that, that can be realized with a backpack vacuum that is uh, incorporated into the correct cleaning procedure used properly. You can reduce labor content and improve your, your direct labor productivity by having a, uh, the correct vacuum, and a backpack vacuum is the most productive one out there by most objective measures. You still have to take a really close look at your cleaning procedure. When we instituted the backpack vacuum, we had to rewrite our cleaning procedure because you can't, you can't, once you strap that thing on, you want to keep it on until you finish vacuuming. Yeah. So. Yeah, you don't want to, you don't, if, if you find your technicians putting it on and taking it off between rooms, then you're not going to get that productivity savings. There's a lot of training that goes with that, and we're going to be talking more about training and all the aspects of that here shortly, but uh, properly trained, there's a real productivity savings to be uh, realized. So, what is 20 minutes of uh, labor per home worth? Here's a... Uh, quick example just to illustrate what it could be worth. Uh, the easiest way to do the math on any type of these productivity measures is when you're dealing with minutes to convert everything to hours. 
So 20 minutes, when you take 20 minutes divided by 60 minutes, that's 0.33. 20 minutes is basically a third of an hour. It's exactly a third of an hour. So if you take 0.33 hours and assume that your your average uh, technician's pay is 20, uh, excuse me, $10 an hour, 0.33 times 10 is $3.33. Anybody that's ever met a payroll uh, knows that your actual uh, direct labor cost, in this case for that 20 minutes, would be more than $3.33 uh, because you also have to pay your employer part of your payroll taxes, you have to pay your workers' comp insurance, you have to pay uh, unemployment insurance, there's a lot of other uh, monies that as a company you have to pay above and beyond that $3.33. I'm and that can vary from state to state and company to company. It does vary state to state, company to company, but we're going to assume three dollars and excuse me, a dollar excuse me, one point two five, we're going to bump that up. Basically we're going to add twenty five percent to this three dollars and thirty three cents to account for the tax and insurance, which would give you what we're going to call a loaded uh value of four dollars and sixteen cents. So if you could save twenty minutes, cut twenty minutes off of your direct labor time and to clean a home based on ten dollars an hour, that could really equate to over four dollars in savings that you could realize uh for that home. Assume that you're cleaning three homes a day, then four dollars and sixteen cents times three homes would be almost uh twelve dollars, you know, twelve and a half dollars, twelve dollars and forty eight cents in this example. That's uh, daily savings. Take that daily savings and multiply it times five days in a week, and it would take you up to over $62 of savings for the week. And, you know, next logical thing would be to take that, multiply it times 52. On an annual basis, that's over $3,200 that you could save if you could reduce 20 minutes per home just by reducing the amount of time that it would take to vacuum it. Now, what we're talking about here is a lot broader than just a vacuum. It has to do with, you know, all the tools you're using and what methods you're using and how you're training. You can spend all the money in the world buying better tools, and it will help you somewhat, uh, depending upon what it is that you're, you're investing in. But without the proper training and the proper measurement and the, and the proper supervision and leadership, you really aren't going to get the return that, that you would hope to get. So it's a system. You have to do all of these things. Everything is that we're talking about is necessary, but you have to put it all together in order to have something that's sufficient. You want to talk about a cleaning procedure? Um, this is an example of something we put together for our new trainees. This example, of course, is how to clean a tub or shower with a ladybug. And um, we took a couple of months with a beta team, and we went out into the field. I had a I had a ladybug for about ten years before we actually started using it them in the field. So I had a basic idea of how the most efficient way to clean a sh tub or shower was. But once we got it into the field, I got a whole new perspective in terms of how to use it and how to use it efficiently. And having some of our um, experienced uh, cleaning technicians get in there and play with it, they came up with some really neat ideas and shortcuts. And so we distilled it into this training, step by step, and this is what we train to, this is what we inspect to, this is what we um, evaluate our cleaning technicians on how well they follow this and if someone comes up with another suggestion you know that's how we develop this system so we're always open to hearing oh I've got a shortcut or I've got a neater way to do that um, I would say probably 90 percent of the time it's not mm -hmm. but um, we do have a, we do get a few gems here and there, and we just adjust our training to that. Um, but this is what everything grows from, our cleaning procedure. We train to it, we clean to it, we inspect to it, and we um, evaluate our cleaning technicians on how well they follow it, and um, they make more money because of it. Yeah. It 
it's a dynamic process. It's ongoing. We're constantly revising our cleaning procedures or in, in the standardized processes we're talking about. But that being said, there's a standardized process that we have in place in order to improve our processes. Uh, we do what we call consensus-based uh, improvement, where if anybody has an idea, it, we have to reach consensus amongst all stakeholders that that idea is an improvement over what it is that we're doing. Uh, whenever possible, we want to be able to measure uh, the results. In some cases, that's not possible, but we still want to make sure that, that it's deemed to be an improvement by, by all stakeholders. If that's the case, then we will uh, adopt that improvement and change our procedure. The thing that you don't want to do when you're getting a lot of people involved in continuous improvement, looking for opportunities, is just leave everybody with the thought of, I'm going to go out and figure out what I think is best and do it in my own way. No, you want everybody in your organization, every cleaning technician to be cleaning the same way, using the same methodology, the same processes, the same procedure, and you must insist upon that. We're going to talk about some ways a little bit later as to how to make that happen. Now, not, we're not saying this is easy. You have to be dedicated to it, and you have to um, make sure it happens. Because, And it all grew out of the frustration I felt when we first started this business is I would train people and I would go out in the field and they'd be doing their own thing and I felt my thought was I showed you the easiest way to do that why aren't you doing what I told you to do and um, sometimes my way wasn't the best but when we did finally dedicate ourselves to putting it down on paper, the best practices, and training to it, um, you have to keep training to it because the, um, people do go out into the field and they do develop bad habits. So they And they need to know that you inspect and that you um, their pay is determined on how well they follow it. Another aspect of this is uh, having a standardized uh, specification of work that a lot of it is the same between homes, but at the same time you need uh, uh, location-specific uh, specification of work for any of the uh, nuances between home to home. This is an example of a uh, worksheet that we would give to a cleaning team that uh, has a lot of things on it. It gives you everything from how to get there, the various things you need to be doing in the home, are there pets, so on and so forth. It's got rooms, and this actually goes on for, for a couple of pages. This is the top page. But I also stuck this in here to illustrate that there's a component for the work measurement. It's where the, the captain and the teammate cleaning the home has an opportunity to record their start and stop times. And from this, we're able to do some arithmetic to figure out what their uh, productivity is. And we have an illustration here that if you do the math between, uh, I guess this is 12.39 and they finished at 1.44, they were in the home for an hour and five minutes. Remember, we needed to uh, convert everything to, in this case, we're going to convert it to hours, so we're going to take the five minutes and divide it by 60, and that's .084. So they were in the home 1.084 clock hours, the actual time that went by on the clock. That's not labor hours, though, because you had two technicians in there. So I'm going to take that number, multiply it times two. It's going to give you 2.167 labor hours. You remember our definition for productivity that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, which is revenue per labor hour. So we take the $124 that this uh, particular client paid for this cleaning, divided by 2.167, that gives us 57 point, uh, to two dollars, uh, fifty-seven dollars and twenty-two cents per labor hour. I like that. That's good. <laughs> um, another tool for work measurement. We would not do this for every home. For this, we do do this for every home, and we have a track record. And we know how long it takes to clean this particular home uh, for every time it is cleaned. And um, that's important information for us to have. And when we're evaluating various changes to our cleaning methodology, one of the things we would do is go back and see, well, how long did it take us to clean that home with that uh, you know, new tool or, or, or new cleaning method, whatever the change might be. 
And if we can see across the number of homes that we already have a baseline that, that we're seeing improvement, then that gives us a pretty good indication that we're on to something. If we really want to get down to the nitty-gritty nuts and bolts, there's uh, you know, a tool such as this that we would use to start capturing more detailed information on um, on an area by area basis, how big it is and how it's furnished and how long it's taking us to uh, perform specific activities. And this is uh, something that would be on a very isolated you know, basis, evaluating a new tool or a method. Certainly wouldn't expect every team to do this on, on every cleaning because it would uh, take a whole lot of time. You want to talk about training? Sure. Okay, go ahead. When you train, um, our philosophy is training is ongoing. You train your new hires, and just from the school of hard knocks, you just can't let them go out into the field and forget your training. You have to constantly remind them of how they're supposed to do things. So you're always training your new hires as they come in, but um, you're always, always training your incumbents. And um, for our new hires, they go through a classroom training um, where we sit down and go through, especially our cleaning procedure, and we train them here in the facility. We have a bathroom and a kitchen set up and, um, and living room, all that stuff set up, and we mess it up and we dust it up and we show them how to use our, our equipment according to our cleaning procedure so they are just totally not dumbstruck when they get out into the field. So, um, And then they spend about five days in the field training with a training team and they are trained to train and then we do a competency and performance review and we determine whether they got it and they can come work for us. Um, with our incumbent training, we are dedicated to daily in-services. 10 to 15 minutes every morning, we do safety training, we do our, um, we do our... We do everything we from do. defensive driving to uh, these are the various tools we use, and this is how you use it, and these are uh -huh. little tricks to be more productive. We do right. customer service training. Uh, everything. We have five days a week to fill, and we use them, and... Um, I think late, latest thing we've been kind of hitting hard on is breakage. Yeah. <laughs> we've been spending a little extra time on um, how to avoid breakage. Just whatever comes up, we make sure we have the time for it. But, but the, the, the overarching thought here is it's just an ongoing thing. It doesn't matter. Certainly, you know, we need to train new hires, but that's not where you, that's where we start, not where we, we, we stop. Mm -hmm. the, the, the real value is when you keep reinforcing day in and day out. Field inspections. We've got several things here we do with our incumbents, but field inspections are very important if you're out ever inspecting work. And if you want to make sure that you're being as productive as, as, as you want to be, it's important to be going out to making sure that not only is the place being clean, but that the proper procedures are being used. And if they aren't, it's an opportunity to reinforce that. And if, you have, if you've ever heard of training your clients, too, we have a newsletter. We've done newsletters. Here's just an example of a, of a quick video. We talked about uh, aprons earlier and training, and these are the type of tools that uh, would, would be useful that you could use in an in-service in the morning to share with your uh, cleaning technicians on how to wear an apron. You can't take anything for granted. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess this, this is the first training video we ever did. <laughs> no, that's not true, but it's one of the early ones. The shows us the easiest way to Sometimes we have difficulty getting the clip adjusted on our cleaning apron so it fits appropriately around our waist. As a last resort, sometimes we tie a knot onto the clip on the adjust. First, we need to recognize there are two parts to the apron clip. The first part of the clip is the female side, which is sewn to the short strap of the apron. The second piece of the clip is the male clip. The long apron strap is threaded on this piece in order to adjust for waist size and comfortable fit. The easiest way to thread the male piece in step one, hold the clip in your right hand and the long strap in your left hand.
In step two, from underneath the clip, insert the end of the long strap into the slot of the male clip that is closest to the place where the two pieces of the clip meet. Pull it through. In step three, take your right hand, grab the strap, and feed the long strap over the notched bar and back into the slot on the end of the male clip. Pull the strap tightly and the strap will stay in place wherever it is adjusted. To put the apron on, unclip the strap, place the apron around your waist with the clip in front and snap the clip closed. Adjust your strap to a comfortable position so it doesn't Twist the clip around to your back so the apron pockets are in front and you are ready to go. Ta-da! <laughs> you know, it, it, it takes that level of, of, of detail and a lot of, you know, initially I, you know, I've gotten, we've gotten feedback that this is kind of silly and common sense, but uh, when you can take your training to this level, put it back in the context of what 20 minutes means in a home and you don't get 20 minutes purely by doing one thing, it's a couple minutes here and a couple minutes there, but it adds up and if you, you do the math on, on what it can mean at the end of the day, at the end of the year, even more importantly, uh, these are, are small investments of time and, and, and energy doing this type of training. Team participation is, is an important part of this. Um, you need a uh, you know, how do you, how do you get people you know excited about about being more productive? Uh, we believe a big part of it starts with pay. If you can create a financial incentive for somebody to be be more productive, uh, you're going to get people uh, to really be committed and excited about doing it. Uh, I guess one of the more obvious ways of doing it is to have some commission uh, based uh, pay plan where people are being paid on the amount of work that they're producing as opposed to just being paid for how many hours they're uh, out out in the field doing work. Um, if you're paying hourly, that still doesn't mean that you can't uh, come up with ways to create a financial incentive. You can have bonuses and, and, and promotions uh, based upon or reaching certain levels of productivity. Um, one opportunity to, to, to take advantage of when you're, when you're doing these pay plans is to get your uh, cleaning technicians involved in calculating their levels of productivity. The worksheet that we looked at earlier and the math that we went through in terms of calculating revenue per hour, you want your cleaning technicians to be able to do that and understand that when they're making that number go up, that productivity number go up, that they're making more money too. Um, in addition to just a pay plan, you, you, you want to get your cleaning technicians involved in product evaluation. All the uh, tools that, that we uh, talk about here with modern cleaning and all the things that we've done uh, in terms of evolving the tool set that we use, we uh, had our, our you know, most talented uh, senior technicians evolved in participating in that process. Uh, it's important for a couple reasons. Uh, if you've been cleaning homes for a long time, you know what works and what doesn't. You're particularly motivated to find tools that help you be more productive if your pay plan is tied to that because it's going to help them make more money. And um, it's, it's a better way of, of, or at least it's, it's, it's a good way to validate, you know, if you're thinking correctly and if your numbers are matching up with uh, what's actually happening in the field. Beyond just product evaluation, it gets into process design. You want your cleaning technicians to be to participate in uh, coming up with their cleaning procedure. We talked about that earlier and that, you know, we want everybody to participate, but we need to do it in a way where we make sure that it's consensus-based and can be backed up and with, with, with objective measurements whenever possible and before implementing, and then it's documented and implemented in a formal way, so everybody's doing it that way. And not only the cleaning procedure, but a cleaning procedure really isn't worth anything without having an effective training program. And the cleaning procedure is the easy part in the whole scheme of things. It's effectively training and being able to follow up and measure and provide the feedback and creating the accountability. So, all of that's necessary in order to uh, get the team participation, and you need the team participation in order to effectively do all the other things that we've talked about here to increase productivity. Wow. So with that being said, let's swing back around to the question that we asked at the beginning. Um, how can uh, you clean a home lugging these machines around in the same uh, amount of time as uh, teams uh, do with chemicals? Hopefully, we did a good job of, of giving some insight as to how that works. Um, for the particular tools that we're looking at here, you know, the got a 
perfect clean microfiber wipe, uh, a ladybug dry steam vapor machine, and it's a pro team a backpack vacuum. We evaluated the products. We played around with a number of different cleaning procedures in terms of how to choreograph the use of those and divide the work up uh, amongst technicians. We uh, were able to, to demonstrate to ourselves that we could clean homes in at least the same amount of time, if not a less amount of time, and actually uh, deliver a better uh, outcome at the end. Um, the environmental issues aside, in terms of you know, the disinfection and the, uh, the you know, being safe for the environment, which are important in and of their own right, but aesthetically we were able to uh, meet that expectation, which at the end of the day was pretty much the baseline of the expectation for, for most of our accounts anyway, um, using, using this equipment. Here's some resources here that uh, I guess we've got a few more of these and we'll be sending these out at the end of the presentation. I guess we have uh, some time for, for, for questions. Um, you know, hopefully it was obvious that um, you're able to make more money if you're spending less, you're getting the same amount of work or more work done in less amount of time than uh, that translates into a lower overall expense, certainly, you know, less labor expense, which is the largest part of your uh, overall expense from a P&L standpoint. And that's really the uh, secret of, of, you know, maximizing your, 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 your profit generating potential in this business. If you aren't doing that, you can spend a whole lot of time cleaning a whole lot of homes and still not have anything left over to show for it at the end of the day. Tom, Janice, thank you so much for um, for this uh, you know, talk about measuring time and, and its effect on productivity. Um, let's see, what uh, we've got a question from Heather, and she's asking what uh, what's your recommended timekeeping device? In terms of the work measurement standpoint, that worksheet that we showed you at the end, and it doesn't have to be anything elaborate, but you want to be capturing your start and stop times for, for each uh, job that you perform, and you want to be able to, to record those. Uh, a lot of the uh, scheduling software packages have the ability to record those, <clears throat> and that's how you can get a baseline to, to figure out how long it takes to clean a home. Um, there's other tools out there that are a little more sophisticated. You can use GPS devices to actually, uh, in a more automated way, figure out when your cleaning technicians are getting to a job site and leaving a job site. Um, there's pros and cons to that, but uh, for starters, just any type of uh, way, uh, just a piece of, you know, a form that, that you would develop that each uh, cleaning team would take out that they're recording the uh, start and stop times for, for each home that they clean. Okay. Um, Heather, actually, uh expanded a little bit on the motivation for her question. Um, she's wondering, you know, how time can be used to motivate cleaners to become a little bit faster, to become more efficient, thinking perhaps the stopwatch is more of a factual collector of data. It'll tell you how long it took somebody to do X, whereas a timer, you have X number of minutes and seconds to complete this task, would be a, a different sort of device. Any, any thoughts on that? When we're training, um I guess it, it comes with experience. Uh, when I was in the field more often and spending time with the trainees, I would say, I can clean this bathroom in, in 12 minutes, and let's see how long it takes you. And, of course, I had my watch on, and um, I would watch them and make suggestions as to how they could tweak what they were doing to uh, move a little faster. Um, or be more efficient. So it, it, that was just a, a way we trained. But when I was out in the field cleaning, I would always be watching my watch. I would always, I would set goals for myself. Um, okay, the last time I was in this house, I did this bathroom in 17 minutes. Let me see if I can get it down to 15 and not skip any steps or not trip over something and kill myself. So it's, um, it's things like that. Um, was that 
Every, everybody, everybody knows what their productivity is supposed to be, and that's very easily translated into how long should it take us to clean this home. And if, if they're making the number or exceeding it, you know, they know it at the end of the day. If they aren't making the number, they know that at the end of the day, too. And uh, in short order, your, your team leaders get pretty good at, at monitoring that, and if they are falling behind, uh, you know, it, it could be for one of a number of reasons, but uh, if, if you're recording the start and stop times and having people go through the process of, of figuring out what their levels of productivity are, and if you're providing that feedback in, in, in coaching, it, uh, to a large part, you know, becomes self-policing. And as a profit think, motive, it's a profit motive. At the end of the day, it's like oh, I'm not making my number. I'm not making any money. We do. We pay commission. I didn't state that clearly, but but our our uh, compensation plan is based heavily on on commission. So people are financially rewarded as they learn to become more efficient and, and productive. Thanks, and Heather. Thank you for that question. I I don't think we'd. Uh, Really moved moved beyond the the measurement to to think about how it could become a motivational tool, and that's a, an excellent idea. Uh, Bessie asks, um, do you recommend clients to have their own uh, wiping uh, cloths or any other piece of of equipment to use during the cleaning procedure, um, or, or is it you know, and how does that affect productivity if that's your practice? <laughs> I'm trying to think of a nice way to no. <laughs> I don't want to use their stuff. I can't I can't um train to it, I can't clean it, I can't maintain it, I don't want it to use any of their stuff. And OSHA kind of backs us up on that. OSHA regulations state that you that employers are required to train their people on the equipment that they use in their work site and that's how I discourage customers from our clients from kind of dictating to me what they want used. Um, I mean I have a very nice uh, way to say it um, but that we can't we can't do what we do if we're using their um, all the di all the kind of different stuff that they come up with to use so they come up with some wild stuff and it gets back in part to uh, the basic elements of work and the ones that are ineffective and you don't want to have to be figuring out how this works and the the nuances between this tool and that tool and this product and that product if you've got your stuff that you use day after day home after home you become more efficient mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this has been a great presentation, guys. Thank you so much. Um, not seeing any more questions, so I'll go ahead and wrap us up for today. Um, reminding everyone that um, Tom and Janice are available. They uh, they have their uh, phone number uh, for Modern Cleaning and the the direct uh, email line for Modern Cleaning. Um, I think we've got a, a an image of that in a couple of slides. If Tom, if you might. Uh, might sure. move in that direction for me I'm so everybody can see that. Um, but uh, certainly, the, you know, I see many familiar faces on our call today, or many many names. I guess I can't see your faces yet. Um, but uh, you know, modern cleaning is uh, has a growing reputation for for being a, a reliable resource um, about the the effectiveness and the safety of a variety of types of equipment, particularly some emerging technologies. I think we're pretty familiar with some of the, the good old standards, and, and they've uh, made particular strides in, in testing and identifying um, emerging technologies to, uh, to consider, and that's one of the reasons they're uh, uh, such, uh, such experts in productivity, because they do a lot of work um, figuring out, you know, if we were to change, what would our new cleaning procedure look like to continue maintaining our level of productivity? Um, so certainly got that in mind. And, and as you see, they can work it out into the numbers. They're, you know, it's 
they, they've got the same bottom line as you do. They want that profitability at the end of the day. Um, so if, as you think of uh, continuing questions, please uh, please give them a call and, and share your interest with them in, in, in learning about more technologies and, and more ways of uh, measuring and really defining what cleaning is, what sanitizing is, what disinfecting is, and, and how to best bring that to your clients. We certainly thank you all for joining us today. Tom Janis, any, any final words before we sign off? Thank you for joining us. Appreciate the uh, opportunity. Uh, I guess uh, third Thursday at 3:30 uh, in the month of October, we're going to be in Chicago. Um, right, that's that's the 18th, um, and we will be in Chicago at the uh, uh, ARCSI convention. Both ISE and Modern Cleaning will be there, and. Uh, we will certainly let you know uh, by by either website um, what uh, what presentations and uh, uh, classes and uh, different different uh, information you can view from our websites. We'll uh, be doing this presentation while we're in Chicago. We'll be doing it live. If you're there, come by and see us. If uh, you're not going to be in Chicago, uh, we hope to see you uh, this time next month. Sounds great, Tom. Thank you so much, and we will look forward to seeing you all again next month. Thank you.